Um, my name is Idelle O'Toole. Uh, I'm a professor in London and a board member of the ESDR. Uh, so you're all very welcome to the ESDR live Zoom uh, webinar, uh, which is keeping the skin scientific community up to date with recent findings in skin research. So today it is the freshly baked session featuring two recent high impact publications coming straight to you from the ESDR. Uh, my co-chair is Leo Eckhart from Vienna, who will moderate the discussion. Please put any questions in the chat or questions and answers. This session has been kindly sponsored by Pfizer, Bristol Myers Squibb and Almorel. So I'm very pleased to introduce the uh, first speaker. Um, the first speaker is Satoshi uh, Nakamizo, and he going to talk about his recent publication in the Journal uh, of Experimental Medicine. So Satoshi is a medical doctor. He obtained his degree uh, in Japan in 2007 from Saga uh, University. Um, he did his PhD uh, under uh, Professor Kinji Kabashima in Kyoto uh, University. And subsequently, he went to ASTAR in uh, Singapore, where he continued to work under uh, Kenji and also with uh, Florian Genu. Um, his research project was on diet and dermatitis and single cell analysis of skin immune cells. He's now back in Japan and he's an assistant professor at the Department of Dermatology uh, in Kyoto. Um, so he's going to talk about this uh, paper on single cell analysis uh, of um, human skin identifying uh, specific dendritic cell types in psoriasis. So uh, thank you, Satoshi. Okay, so yeah, I will start my presentation. Yeah, it's my pleasure to present our data to the ESR kitchen. So today we, uh, we talk only the essence of the paper. So if you want to know the detail of the data, please see this JM paper. So the psoriasis is a chronic inflammatory skin disease. The dendritic cells are important in the pathogenesis of psoriasis. In fact, most cases of psoriasis can be treated with neutralizing antibody to IL-23 produced by the dendritic cells. Three types of dendritic cells are known to be present in the human skin. These are Langerhans cells in the epidermis, conventional type 1 dendritic cells, CDC1, and conventional type 2 dendritic cells, CDC2, in the dermis. Langerhans cells acquire antigens from the epidermis and contribute to the Th2, Th17, and regulatory T cells. In addition, CDC1 are important for Th1 and cytotoxic T cell differentiation, while CDC2 are important for Th2 and Th17 induction. We recently described a new subset of inflammatory CD14 positive DC3 in human blood. Although the cytokine produced by DC3 after stimulation in vitro are known, DC3 function in vivo and contribution to disease pathophysiology remain poorly characterized. Thus, to address the role of disease in chronic inflammatory skin diseases, we collected skin biopsies from two patients with atopic dermatitis and two patients with psoriasis from both non-regional and regional skins, and prepare single-cell suspension by enzymatic digestion. We used single-cell flow cytometry and rna stick of index sorted cells from healthy and diseased skin to generate an unbiased profile of dishes and macrophages, and to describe their distinct molecular signatures and proportions in the skin regions of atopic dermatitis and psoriasis patients. Single-cell rna stick data were then mapped into UMAP space to identify cell clusters based on transcriptional similarity and 
heat map of surface protein expression level described from flow cytometry data were overlaid on the UMAP identified cell subset to identify CD141 positive, CDC1, CD1C positive, CD88 negative, CDC2, and CD88 positive, CD14 positive, CD1C negative macrophages. We previously reported that CD, C, CDC2 comprises CD14 negative DC2 and CD14 positive DC3, and that DC3 plays an important role in the inflammatory disease. Thus, CDC2 was divided into CD14 negative DC2 and CD14 positive DC3 subset. We also cluster the cell in an unsupervised way based on RNA expression using the k nearest neighbor algorithm, then analyze differentially expressed genes in the each cluster to conform the annotation in the cell subset defined based on index cell protein expression data. Together, these approaches review that cluster one, this yellow cluster, correspond to CDC1, this uh, cluster expressed XCR1, and cluster two to four here correspond to DC2, this cluster highly expressed HLADR, and cluster five to seven likely correspond to DC3. Cutaneous CD14 positive DC3 expressed uh, EREG, SLC2A3, IL23A, and heat shock protein, which are not reported as being expressed by DC3 in the blood likely indicating skin-specific CD14 positive DC3 differentiation in response to local cues. We then examine the related proportions of each disease and macrophage subset in healthy and disease skin conditions. Because our single-cell RNA-seq data was based on a few patients, we aim to validate our observations and thus compare the frequency of each subset in the skin using flow cytometry on additional patients, 14 atypic dermatitis and 16 psoriasis patients. We found that the proportion of DC3 and macrophages was higher in psoriasis regional skin than non-regional skin. However, there was no difference in cell population abundance between non-regional and regional skin regions in atypic dermatitis. Next, as IL-1-beta and IL-23A have been reported to play an important role in the development of psoriasis, we examine the self-producing IL-1-beta and IL-23A. We found that the overall expression level of IL-1-beta and IL-23A transcript and the frequency of IL-1-beta single positive and IL-1-beta IL-23A double positive cells were higher in psoriasis regional skin than non-regional skin. The majority of cells ex the majority of cells expressing IL-1-beta alone were macrophages, while most of the IL-1-beta IL-23A co-expressing cells were DC3. Finally, we used immunohistochemistry to confirm that CD14 positive DC3 produce IL-23. The staining of psoriasis regional skin with antibodies against CD1C, CD14, and IL-23 shows that the main source of IL-23 main source of IL-23 was CD14 positive DC3 and macrophages. This is the immunostaining. The CD1C single positive cell is DC2, and the CD14 single positive cell is macrophages, and the CD14 and CD1C double positive cells here is DC3. When you see the R23 staining, the double positive cell produced R23, and also the CD14 single positive cell also express the R23. The number of R23 producing cells did not differ between CD14 positive DC3 and macrophages. 
but most CD14 positive DC3 producing IL23, which was consistent with the result of our single cell RNA sequencing analysis. We then asked whether specific marker expression pattern was associated with IL1 beta, IL23 echo expressing cells, and found that they were characterized by CD83, an activation marker for DC, ARIG, associated with the fibrosis, and the OLR1, and the SLC2S3, the receptor for glucose and lipid. Immunostaining showed that higher percentage of GLUT3, this is the protein of SLC2S3, positively in CD14 positive DC3 than DC2 and macrophages. In psoriasis regional skin, the number of HLDR GLUT3 double positive cells was increased in the site of was increased at the site of accumulation of lymphocytes in the superficial dermis. This population is increased in psoriasis, and this cell is located in the here. This is a lymphoid cluster. These results indicate that GLUT3 positive CD14 positive DC3 are more abundant in psoriasis renewal skin and may produce IL23A. This is a summary slide. Using high dimensional single cell protein and RNA expression analysis of human cutaneous APCs, we have precisely delineated all DC and macrophage subset in the skin. We also identified IL1 beta, IL23 echo expressing CD14 positive DC3 in the psoriasis skin. Hence, it might be possible to discover new therapeutic target for psoriasis by developing drugs that inhibit metabolism by targeting IL1 beta, IL23 echo producing CD14 positive DC3. This study is kindly supported by Kyoto University member and A star in Singapore member, especially Professor Kenji Kabashima and Professor Florongine, and Charles Anthony. Thank you for attention. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Satoshi. Uh, that was uh, fantastic. Um, questions will be at the end, so we'll move on now to the next speaker. So the next speaker is uh, Janis Koster. Uh, he did his undergraduate studies in technical biology at the uh, University of Stuttgart. He completed a bachelor's thesis uh, at Emory and a master's thesis in uh, Matthias Swabel's lab at UCSF before he joined uh, Sarah's lab at the Max Planck Institute for Biology of Aging in Cologne. His research interests lie in the area of stem cells and epigenetics. And during his PhD uh, with Sarah, he investigated how mechanical changes in the stem cell niche upon aging cause epigenetic changes and reduced stem cell potential. Um, he's now doing a postdoc in the area of gene therapy um, with Roche in uh, Basel. Um, so he's going to talk to us about the work uh, he performed during his PhD and his recent very nice uh, publication in Nature Cell Biology. Uh, so thank you. You can share your uh, screen, Janis. Thank you, Dave, for this nice introduction. And thank you, Istia, for the uh, possibility to, to present our work here. Um, my talk is titled New Stiffening Compromises Health Like Stem Cell Potential During Aging by Reducing Bivalent Promoter Accessibility, which is also the title of the paper. And so I basically will talk a bit about um, stem cell aging and epigenetics and what this might have to do with um, changes in the niche. Um, yeah, so during aging um, in the skin, what we often observe is a reduced regenerative potential. Um, we see also increased incidence of skin cancers and loss of barrier functions. So these three are often um, can be connected to, to deregulation of stem cells. And this is kind of why we became interested in 
uh, stem cell aging. And to study this, we use hair follicle as a paradigm. And um, we think they're a very good model to study this because they are already very well characterized. They go and undergo constant self renewal to regenerate the hair follicle. And they have a very defined um, activation step, uh, activation switch from, from quiescence uh, to activation. They participate um, besides being involved in the regeneration of the hair follicle also in wound healing, but they can also be cells of origin for, for cancers. And this project actually started when we did some, some attack sequencing, I'm oh, sorry. Um, so, so we wanted to, to investigate the hair follicle stem cells kind of at the onset of aging, um, where we can see that the hair follicle morphology is still very normal. Um, you don't really see a difference between the young and aged hair follicle. But what we found um, when the mice are two years old, we see that we have a quite a reduction in the percentage of hair follicle stem cells that we are seeing by flow cytometry and the markers into green alpha 6 and C34. And then this project kind of for me started when we did attack sequencing of this both um, half liquid stem cell population, young and aged. And so attack seek is a method where you can use to find changes in the open and closed chromatin. So you have open chromatin in the genome that are usually active. And then you have regions that are more compacted, more silenced, so, so not active. And with this method, we found that we have many regions in the genome of the hair stem cells that in aged uh, mice become less open. So they become more compacted. Um, in the seed map, every single row is one region in the genome. And the darker the blue, the more open is this region. Um, to kind of find out what this could mean, potentially, we did as a next step um, some clustering of this data together with ChIP-seq data. So we had so we generated data uh, for HEK4 trimutilation, which is an activated mark uh, you can usually find at the promoter of active transcribed genes. And we had generated ChIP-seq data for HEK27 trimutilation, which is usually um, repressive mark. And so when we did clustered the results from our attack seek, so we just took here these, these regions which are uh, less accessible in the HF liquid stem cells and clustered, clustered this with the chip seek data, we found one cluster that we think is very interesting. And um, so this cluster is this one C4 and in this cluster you have like a reduced accessibility um, and you also have what is very interesting, actually both marks. So you have this activating mark, HUK4 trimutilation, and also the repressive mark, HUK27 trimutilation. Um, and also here, what you can see is reduction in the HUK4 trimutilation in the HF liver stem cells. So regions that usually have this both marks, they are called bivalent genes. And um, what is very interesting about bivalent genes is that once a signal reaches a certain threshold, you, um, you're, um, you get a very robust activation of these genes, um, as you can see here. And also you can find these genes, um, these, these marks often at stem cell genes. So when we looked a bit more closer, what kind of genes are in this cluster? we found that we have many genes involved in developmental processes, um, but also genes involved in, in stem cell fate and differentiation and cell cycle and stem cell self-renewal. So we thought, okay, if these genes that have both these marks and usually get very robustly activated upon a certain uh, signal threshold, if these are less accessible in the HF like the stem cells, maybe this also means that these genes are less accessible in HF follicle stem cells, uh, less activatable, and also the stem cells themselves are less activatable. To test this, we did a depilation assay where we depilated the hair of young and aged mice. And just by eye, you can already see, so you can see after five days, just by eye, looking at the skin, you can see that the, the young skin looks a bit more darker, a bit more blackish. 
um, which is a sign that the, the skin is uh, slowly turning into to anagen. Um, so the activated phase of the hair flicker, while the aged skin is still very pinkish, um, which is a sign that the hair flicker there is um, probably still an intelligent, and so in the, the quiescent phase. And also if we look already after 24 hours, um, and we find that um, we see less EDU positive cells. And also after 24 hours, if we look at the expression of genes from this um, bivalent cluster, we see that these genes are less expressed in the HF liquid stem cells. Um, yes, yeah, so the next finding we had was actually very surprising. Um, so we took skin as so we took the, the cells um, from young and aged mice, they have liquid stem cells and transplanted them into nude mice. And we had a very surprising observation that actually both cell populations, so the, the young have stem cells, but also the aged have stem cells, had both the same potential to, to give rise to hair. And also if we transplant them into a synthetic niche, so we have plated them into matrix gel and we culture them in a very defined media. We also see that there we don't see a difference in the stem cell um, percentage and also not a change um, when we try to activate them by a sonic hedgehog inhibitor, we also see there are no difference between the, the stem cells. And also, if you look again at the genes from, from this cluster, we don't see a um, difference in the expression. And if you look at HUK4 trimethylation, which is this activating mark that we saw is reduced, um, we don't see this reduction here anymore. We, so we see the same levels of HEK4 trimethylation here at the young and at the aged have the good stem cells. Um, so this is why we think that the niche probably has a very um, important impact on the aging of the this, this stem cells. And to find out what might be causing like this effect in the, the old niche or why is like the old niche worse than the young niche um, to, to kind of investigate this with the whole skin proteomics. And we want, what we found is here that we saw that we have upregulation of a lot of laminins, of collagens, but also of um, cross-linking enzymes. So we see many changes in the uh, ECM composition. And um, so we thought that this probably also leads to changes in the mechanics of the skin. And indeed, if we look by EM at the basement membrane of the uh, half liquid stem cells in young skin and in old skin, we see that the basement membrane and the aged skin is much st uh, thicker. And also if we measure then the, the stiffness by FM, we see that the stiffness is much higher in the aged basement membrane. Next, we wanted to find out does this change in basement membrane stiffness um, already have an influence on the half liquid stem cells? So to test this, we actually did two different approaches. And the first approach was to take skin from young adult mice, um, remove all the cells, and then plate back cells on these scaffolds. And what was very interesting to see is that if we plate back the cells on the scaffolds, on this young and aged um, basement membranes, we see that the cells on the H basement membrane um, are less prolifer proliferative and also show um, less expression for LIF1, which is also one of the genes from, from this bivalent cluster. The second approach was to, to engineer hydrogels. So here we took um, major gel like we did before, but, but collagen and used a PEG crosslinker. And by this, we could use uh, engineer hydrogels that kind of match the, the stiffness of the, the young and the old basement membrane. Then we looked again at uh, genes from this bivalent cluster and kind of what we see before was that uh, there's no change between the young and old cells, but there's a change if we put the cells into the stiff hydrogel. Then we have less expression of these genes. Um, <clears throat> so what is now kind of causing the reduction of the expression of these genes or this, this um, um, 
less accessibility of this bivalent genes, um, how is this now protect, um, uh, connected um, with the, the stiffness, change in stiffness? And so, so one thing we observed um, when we looked very closely at the follicular stem cell was that um, just by looking at the, the nuclei, we can already see that the nuclei in the, of the HF follicular stem cells seem to be um, less circular and more elongated, which is a sign that these cells could experience higher mechanical stress. And this is also in line with um, another experiment where we stain for uh, phosphomycin. And so we also see there that the um, H Catholic stem cells have higher phosphorylation uh, of myosin, um, which both indication that these cells are experiencing higher mechanical stress. And from, from previous um, work in our lab, but also from others, we know that increased mechanical stress can lead to reduction in transcription. And um, so this is actually also what we see um, uh, by staining, but also by chip, um, we see that we have reduction of uh, transcription. And we can also recapitulate this in the hydrogels. So we see the same in the stiffer hydrogels. And also, um, we use two in vivo models. Um, I'm not showing the data here, but if, you, uh, if you're interested, uh, feel free to look into the paper a bit more closely. Uh, so we use two in vivo models where we um, knocked out um, ECM proteins. And by this, we can change the, the basement membrane. And we see the, the basement membrane stiffness and we see similar effects. So we also see the stiffening of the basement membrane in these in vivo models. Um, we see reduced half-liquid stem cells. And we also see this reduction of um, transcription. And so to kind of sum up what we think is happening in during aging of the affiliate stem cells. So we think we have an altered ECM composition, which then leads to an increase in basement membrane stiffness. Um, this increase in basement membrane stiffness leads to higher mechanical stress, which down regulates uh, global transcription. And by this, we also have a reduction of, of HBK4 trimethylation and chromatin accessibility at this bivalent genes. So while in the um, young half follicular, young, young half follicular stem cells, um, we have these, these bivalent genes in this bivalent states so upon activation, you have this robust activation of the genes, but also the stem cells. Um, but then in the HF stem cells, these regions are more compact. Um, so in the end, you have a reduced activation of these genes, but then also of the, the stem cells, um, which leads then to reduced half stem cell potency. And we think this leads then in the long run also to reduced number of half stem cells. And by this, I would like to uh, thank first, of course, uh, Sarah for the possibility to, to do this um, project in her lab and all the other members from the Rickstein lab, all our collaborations, um, especially Karen Neeson, um, for a lot of support and mentoring. And thank you all for, for listening and looking forward to your questions. Thank you very much, Yanis, for this excellent presentation. And also thanks again to Satoshi for also a very nice presentation. And both papers are now open for discussion. So we will try to mix the questions uh, and maybe just let's begin with a question to, to Yanis. So maybe if you can have a look also in the chat so you can <laughs> read together with me. So thanks for the interesting uh, question. Uh, has anyone uh, transplanted old versus young human hair biopsies into nude mice? And if so, what were the results on stem cell activation? Also, if the surrounding environment determines hair growth, how can hair transplants work since we are transplanting from an area of growth into an area of no growth? Um, so very interesting question. So um, I'm not aware of transplanting the, the complete biopsies. So I think they're talking about like the whole hair follicle. Um, so I'm not aware of this. Um, would be interesting because I think, I mean, if you transplant a hair, hair follicle, 
then you also have probably the, the basement membrane, um, which we think is like the, the main driver here. And um, yeah, it would be interesting what, what the results are. Okay, thank you. Uh, let's continue with one more question for Yanis. So is the YAPTAS uh, pathway inhibition mm -hmm. involved in general down regulation of transcription? Yes, this is a very good question. So we really looked quite uh, extensively into to YAPTAS because this was also one thing that we thought, I mean, um, this would be involved, but we didn't see any clear evidence that this has changed. Um, so yeah. Okay, thank you. And another question for Satoshi now. Um, uh, so Idel asked, I was interested to see that the IL-1B and IL-23 double positive CD14 uh, positive cells expressed uh, the gene uh, GLUT3, uh, a glucose transporter. So in view of association of psoriasis uh, with uh, a metabolic syndrome, do you plan to use dietary modifications to see if this affects psoriasis? Thank you, Juan question yes uh, yeah I also want to see uh, the diet directly affects the DC3 to produce DC3 or not previously we check the uh, activation uh, mm, the metabolism compared to the DC3 and uh, IL-23 IL producing monocyte so the uh, um, uh, DC3 have more um, activated by the glucose compared to the monocyte. So I think when we use the specific inhibitor to block the glucose transporter, uh, I think the production of IL-23 should be decreased in psoriasis patients. So I want to plan to use the drug in the mouse model. Okay, thank you. Uh, I have another uh, question to Satoshi. Mm. Uh, maybe I have missed it. So what is the distribution of uh, these TC3 uh, cells in the non-legional uh, uh, skin of psoriasis? Uh, non-legional skin of psoriasis, uh, mainly uh, located around the blood vessels. Mm. Mm. And maybe I have also missed in your presentation. So did you investigate the gene expression in non-lesional versus lesional skin in these DC3 cells? Ah, yes, yes. We also take the uh, gene expression of DC3 in non-lesional regional skin. The in regional skin, DC3 also expressed another um, inflammatory gene, such as uh, IL-8 or some chemokine to, uh, some chemokine for the neutral field recruitment or another cell recruitment, T cell recruitment. Mm -hmm. But uh, also have the potential to produce IL-23. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'm looking if I see more questions now. I have actually one more question to Yanis concerning the role of the mechanical like influences. So you presented the data on the hair follicle, but I was wondering, is it a similar situation in the interfollicular skin? Because also the extracellular matrix will change during aging, or I don't know, in, in other tissues. Can you comment on that? So we haven't looked very extensively at the IFE, um, but what I know is that there's also some publication um, in the nervous system where they also see changes in the, the, um, in the mechanics of the tissue. And so they kind of see similar results that we do. Um, so I think also, I mean, in general, you see like a lot of changes, ECM changes during aging. So I think this could be something that is more also can be um, found in other tissues. Um, yeah, but I think it would be very interesting to, to, uh, to look more at this. Okay, 
thank you. Uh, at, um, uh -huh, well, one more question. I think we can uh, still uh, discuss this one. So regarding the single cell RNA seq study, I'm curious whether the different dendritic cell subpopulations indeed represent stable and distinct DC types, or is it simply a snapshot of a few basic DC types being at different stages of activation? Mm -hmm. Question to Satoshi. Yeah, okay. Yeah, good question. So it is difficult to answer, but uh, uh, for example, uh, DC1, DC2, and DC3 is, uh, is another DC because the uh, precursor was different, but uh, some DC population is not the uh, linear, don't have the linear differentiation, just uh, activate the stage of activation. So when we see the DC population by using single cell RNA sequencing, we we see both the activation stage of dendritic cell and the, uh, and the, the type of DC. So we see the both. So sometimes it is difficult to see the, just to see the activation stage or this is a really different DC. Okay, thank you. I think we have to close uh, uh, the webinar because uh of the time. Uh, thanks again to Yanis and Satoshi for their really excellent and very interesting presentations. So I would like to invite everybody to also attend the next um, ESDR kitchen session, which will be at the, on the 8th of September at the usual time. And it will be a, a sweet and sour discussion between uh, Johan Gudjonsson and Jörg Prinz with, about the topic, is psoriasis an autoimmune disease. And we look forward to this very much. And uh, maybe one final slide, if we can show this, uh, a reminder that we also look forward to uh, meeting all of you at our 50th annual meeting of the ESDR, which will take place uh, virtually on the 22nd to 25th of September. And until the 27th of August, you still have the opportunity to send uh, late breaking abstracts and i hope you use this opportunity if not if you have not already submitted so thanks again to everybody and have a nice afternoon and see you again soon bye 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 bye, -bye.